Well, good evening, CBC. It's good to join you again on Facebook Live. Uh, hopefully, you're able to join us tonight. Um, tonight will be a little bit of a different kind of evening. I sort of, um, hopefully I don't ramble too much, but the goal is sort of just to go give some final thoughts on the book of Revelation, answer a few questions that have been submitted to me. Um, if you have a question tonight, um, I'll try to follow along on some of the comments and maybe I can answer that if I have some time. And so just wanted to sort of wrap this whole thing up. And again, um, just remind us to, to put our hope and our focus on Christ. Uh, I do want to say that uh, <laughs> I love the book of Revelation. It is a hard book to preach. I think it's better to teach in a Sunday school kind of environment. Um, that's probably where I would love to do it better because there's just so many questions that come up and it's hard to go through it um, with so much intensity that's in the book. And so I'd prefer to do it like on a Sunday night kind of Q and A kind of time or Sunday school class. And maybe in the future we can do that. But I did feel like with everything going on in the world, it would be good just to give an overview and hopefully you've appreciated that. Hopefully it's helped you uh, come to understand the book more. But I, I do love the book of Revelation. Uh, why do I say that? Well, one, because uh, I can tie my salvation to the book of Revelation. Uh, if many of you have heard my testimony. It was, I did not grow up in a Christian home. We didn't know the gospel. Um, my oldest brother, who's 13 years older than me, um, was watching a movie called The Omen, which was some weird uh, movie back, I guess, in the 70s, 80s about Damien and the Antichrist and uh, freaked him out. He was in the military at the time and it freaked him out. He, at the end of that movie, they put Revelation 13 on the screen uh, and that passage just captivated him or made, aroused his curiosity. And so he spoke to a navigator's chaplain and that navigator's chaplain led him to Christ. And so, and then he came home totally different and shared the gospel with me. And so I trusted Christ through his witness so in many ways, my brother was saved through a secular movie that I'm sure was not intended to save anyone, but uh, Revelation 13 was just strange enough that caught his attention, led him to Christ. He led me to Christ. And of course, because he was saved through the book of Revelation, that was a key interest in his life. And so, like I said, I was 12 years old. I, I trusted Christ. And some of the earliest books I can remember my brother giving me were Dispensational Truth by Clarence Larkin and Mystery Babylon by Ralph Woodrow. Of course, I got all the little chick tracks, if you remember those or are familiar with those. Some of them a little wild, but um, that's sort of my background. I think over the years, uh, as I have studied more and been challenged by people who have different viewpoints, I feel like my understanding of Revelation has grown, but I do still have such a love for it. And so, Teaching it is something I enjoy doing, though it is a challenge because let's be honest, there is much that we do not understand about the book of Revelation. And I think anyone that's honest should say that. If there's one fear I have is someone that feel, feels like they had it all figured out and will tell you they have it all figured out. And almost a newspaper eschatology where they anything that's in the newspaper, they say that's exactly this. And it's just in, in my mind, not helpful because, like I said before, oftentimes when they're wrong, they do not come back and acknowledge that. They just keep feeding our curiosity, which is not helpful. Uh, scripture says we all see through a glass dimly, meaning none of us have this kind of special uh, knowledge that gives us insight that no one else has. And we need the body of Christ to challenge us and to equip us and help us to understand his word better. And so, again, we approach the book with humility. But hopefully you've learned some things. If nothing else, get a sense. I hope you can almost just think through the book of Revelation. Uh, uh, John says it's the things that he has seen, the things which are, the things which will take place after this. Chapter 1, what did he see? He saw the ascended Christ, the one that he knew and ate with and walk this earth with, now he sees in his ascended glory. And in chapter one, he is just overwhelmed with the glory of Christ and just um, falls down his knees, reminding us again that Revelation is all about Jesus Christ. 
It's the apocalypse. That's a Greek word that means apo, a from, a calypsis, a, a cover or a veil. And so it means the veil is removed or the cover is removed, just like on the Mount of Transfiguration. John is now seeing Christ unveiled and he sees him in his glory. And Revelation is to remind us of the Savior that we worship. He is, uh, he is Lord, he is glorified, and he has all power. He is sovereign. So that's the thing that he had seen, the ascended Christ, chapter 1. Chapters 2 and 3, these seven letters to these seven churches. These seven churches represent churches all through church history. We live in church history. So one of those churches in many ways corresponds to our own church. And I think it's a picture, too, of the whole church age from Ephesus all the way to Laodicea. You almost see a picture of how the church age has gone with Ephesus losing their first love. And then, let's see, oh boy, it's either Sardis or Smyrna, um, the suffering church. And then you see this descent of Pergamum and Thyatira uh, and Sardis, and then um, this descent down into this corruption. And then you see this revival to Philadelphia, and then you see this again decline into Laodicea which in many ways could describe our church age today. And whatever you think about all that, just realize that those churches represent the time that we live in now. Chapter four, what happens? Immediately, John is snatched up to heaven. And I think that is a picture of what's going to happen to the church. And there in heaven, he catches a glimpse of the throne room and he sees um, the glory of God and just all of his splendor. He sees the lamb who is the only one worthy to open the scroll. And the scroll represents the redemption of earth, the title deed to earth. Who is worthy to redeem this earth? Who is our kinsman redeemer? Who is our Goel? Who is the one who is qualified as a son of Abraham and a son of David and the son of man and the son of God? And there's only one. His name is Christ. And he is the one who opens the scroll. So you have that glimpse into heaven, which then sets the scene for chapter 6 through 18, which are what happens on earth during the tribulation. This seven-year period, Daniel's 70th week, Jacob's trouble, uh, the beginning of the day of the Lord. This time frame is shown to us in chapter 6 through 18. And so you remember you have the seven seals. I think that covers the whole seven years. Seven trumpets come out of the seventh seal. That's the last half. Seven bowls, I think, are right there, right before Christ returns. Uh, I think God knows we can't handle all of that in one, so he gives us these interludes. Chapter 7 tells us about the witnesses, the 144,000 who will share the gospel around the globe, and many will come to faith, and many will be martyred. Uh, chapters 10 through 14 give us another interlude, just sort of introducing us to some of the main characters that are within this grand story culminating in the tribulation. Then chapter 17 and 18, this whole picture of Babylon, this city, this spirit that has been the undercurrent behind all of world history, that Satan has always wanted worship for himself. He's always wanted to counterfeit God's kingdom on earth. And so this spirit of Babylon that's always been working, it's like the mystery of lawlessness or the spirit of Antichrist that's always there. And Babylon sort of represents this uh, worldly city, this system, this satanic uh, emphasis. And then uh, it's almost like God introduces Babylon before he tells us about the new Jerusalem and Christ reigning. And so chapter 19, Christ returns, uh, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the faithful and true, the word of God. And uh, that, that day of hope comes as he uh, comes and he deals with sin and he sets up his kingdom on earth, which we looked at this morning. And then chapter in the chapter 20, you have the great white throne judgment where sin is finally dealt with. Uh, those who've refused to trust Christ are judged. Eternal condemnation uh, cast into the lake of fire. And then Revelation 21 and 22, everything that's lost in Genesis 3 regained Revelation 21 and 22. Uh, the garden of chapter uh, Genesis 1 and 2 is now uh, found in a glorified city um, in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, 22. So I think if you can keep all that together, I think you get a sense of, yes, it's an intimidating book. There's things along the way that are hard to interpret. Just take courage because they've been hard to interpret for 2,000 years of church history. But we do know some of the key themes. One, Jesus is Lord. He is going to reign. 
Um, you have no other hope besides Jesus Christ. Uh, well, one of my favorite scenes is, uh, I can't remember exactly the chapter, uh, maybe it's chapter 17, where it talks about the beast with his seven heads and 10 horns and just this dragon. And you just feel like this massive um, enemy that no one can defeat. And it says he's conquered by a lamb, uh, a precious lamb. And so it's just, it's a scene you never see in a movie of uh, this massive dragon being defeated by a lamb. And that's our hope because the lamb that we worship is the sovereign one who is king of kings and lord of lords and the one who is going to reign on this earth. So that's one of the key themes. Another key theme is to hold fast. Uh, throughout that those chapters two and three, it just tells you to hold fast, hold fast. And what does that imply? It implies that as things get darker, we're going to struggle. There's going to be times when uh, we struggle knowing, is God in control? Uh, is it worth following Christ? Uh, the world system, as it grows and becomes more intense, it, it becomes difficult to follow Christ. I don't know what else to say. And he says, oh, hold fast. Uh, just keep walking faithfully and trusting him. And sometimes the best that you can do is just to stand. Uh, it's almost like God just wants you to trust him and just hold fast to who he is. I think another theme is that deception exists. Uh, the evil one is a deceiver and his greatest deception is still to come and the world will fall for it because if you don't love truth, then you're a victim of deception, which again is a reminder to us to hold fast to scripture. Uh, we're going to live in an age more and more where people want their ears tickled. They just, uh, and, and don't think of that just as saying pleasant things. It could just mean that more and more people just want to come and hear things that they already think are true. In other words, don't tell me anything that challenges me. Just tell me what I want to hear. And that can have different kind of uh, connotations. But God's word is to be what we uh, hold to. It's to be our authority. It's to, to govern our lives. And so we are to be aware of deception. And the way you conquer is by loving truth. I think another theme is that God is a God of justice. Uh, we struggle with that in our culture. We love the God of grace. I love God's grace. But God is also a God of justice. And like I read last week, uh, Miroslav Volv's book, I think sometimes we forget that in other parts of the world where they faced atrocities and tragedies and things that we can't even fathom and thankfully have been protected from, uh, they know all about God being a God of justice. Uh, the early church martyred. They understood what it meant to have a God of justice. At some point, God's grace, uh, if it is rejected, then God's justice comes. His wrath is stored up for this day of wrath. And God is a God of justice, and he is just in his judgment. And he is worthy of worship because of his justice, because he will set all things right. And we can trust him. He sees reality better than we do. He understands the full picture. He knows each person's heart. So his judgment is absolutely just and we can trust him. And I think the last theme of Revelation is hope. Um, why did God give us the book to tell us the end of the story? We don't all understand all the particulars, but we have hope and hope is powerful because if you have hope, then I think that gives you perseverance. If you know the end of the story and you know that beyond the darkness, there's light. If you know beyond the pain, uh, there's healing and there's redemption, then it enables you to keep going. And if you don't have hope, then you can't have joy and you can't have peace and you really can't persevere. Uh, hope is what sustains us. And revelation is to give us hope and to remind us uh, that Christ is gonna reign the story is moving to a conclusion, a climax, and we can therefore have hope. That's why I do love the Lord of the Rings trilogy, because uh, many people have said that Tolkien had a theology of hope, and he created the darkness of so much that's going on in the world to remind us that hope is what keeps you going, even in the midst of that, and uh, it's just a good reminder. So hopefully, that will help you as you try to put some of these things together. If you do have more questions, obviously there's good books out there. I mean, some of the ones I like, Charles Ryrie uh, did a real easy one. I think it's called Every Man's Bible Commentary. This is an older version, but, you know, Ryrie gives you a good summation of the of uh, the book of Revelation. Of course, I'm a, a big Walford fan, particularly when it comes to Revelation. 
that whole Dallas Seminary group. So this is a good commentary. If you want to go online, uh, Precept Austin um, has a Tony Garland has an online uh, commentary that's free that uh, is pretty good. Just gives you some overviews, and I think you can find it at PreceptAustin.org. I think if you look it up, Tony Garland Precept Austin, I think you'll find it. Of course, I like the NetBible.org. Uh, that's online as well and has some good notes. And so there's good resources. We live in a day and age where there are good resources. Of course, there's also a bunch of other resources I wouldn't classify as good. And just be careful. Like I said, lots of people love Revelation. They love teaching on a very, I think they like speculation. It does feed our curiosity. And just always be careful as you, uh, as this kind of stuff proliferates, just be care careful and use discernment. And like I said, if someone feels like they have everything figured out, then just, um, uh, just take it with a grain of salt and 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 follow the, some of the predictions they make. And if they have missed something in the past, then that should be a clue to you that probably the rest of the stuff they say is really not worth the time. And so find better material. There's better stuff out there uh, to go to if you have some questions. Speaking of questions, okay, I did get a few. Um, I did want to go over those try to answer them to the best of my ability. And then I'll try to look over at the uh, comments, see if there's any others. Here's the questions I had. Uh, one, Revelation 22.2 mentions the tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. This is a reference to time in the New Jerusalem. How will distinct events be measured in eternity if time no longer exists as we know it? Interesting question. I mean, some of these questions I wasn't expecting, but Okay, we have this tree of life uh, mentioned or possibly several tree of lives. It seems like they're on both sides of the river and there's debates on whether there's one tree with the river going around it or more than one tree and they're just called the tree of life. Uh, if you read Ezekiel, it seems like there's more than one. But apparently they produce fruit every month and this fruit is for the healing of the nations. And there's a lot of questions about that. But the tree of life you saw in Genesis seems to be back now in Revelation. There's no tree of knowledge and good and evil that's been removed. And so now we just have access to the tree of life and it produces fruit every month, it says. Well, if you don't really have a sun and moon or Christ is now our light, then how is time measured? Interesting question. I don't know. <laughs> um, here's what I know is time. Um, obviously, we're in eternity. Um, obviously, our bodies are changed, but there's obviously some aspect of uh, continuity from the past and discontinuity. Um, I think if we're time based creatures, somehow God's going to still um, use that. Um, obviously, it's interesting. They measure the New Jerusalem using measurements that apparently were measurements that they would understand today. So, uh, an angel's measurement and a human measurement are the same to some extent. And so it's almost like even though uh, we're in eternity, there's our measurements still work and maybe time still works in some sense. Maybe it's a, an inner thing that God has given us and his creation. He created us in time. Time has a part of his uh, creation of us. So there must be some sense in which time is still something we're cognizant of. And so and even our bodies, I think we're going to be eating fruit. Now, I don't like fruit. So either they're going to taste like hamburgers to me, I don't know, or God's going to change my taste buds. That's probably more likely. But this eating of fruit reminds us that we're going to have some kind of bodily existence. We're going to have glorified bodies, but just like Jesus glorified body, he continued to eat. Our eternal state is not going to be so divorced from our current one that God created us. The body is good. The material world is good. And he's going to redeem it and use it. And we're going to still enjoy eating and feasting and drinking without the implications of sin. So I guess time will be the same way. Second question. When we're when are we reunited with our bodies? Uh, when we're raptured or die, whichever's first. Uh, when we are absent from our bodies and our soul and spirit is present, uh, what is that body like? Or where's the point where we're given our glorified bodies another good question um i believe to be absent from the bodies be present with the lord so if someone dies now they immediately go into god's presence 
their body isn't going to be resurrected until the rapture. Um, I think when Christ comes back, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So that raises at least one question. What did what kind of existence do they have now? It's a bodiless existence. Their soul and spirit are in God's presence, but their body is not waiting to be resurrected. Some people think we're given an intermediate kind of body. Um, some people, you know, obviously the angels are spirit beings, but they have, they can have tangible um, bodies at times. So God can certainly do that as we're waiting for the glorified body. Uh, I tend to think that, um, Time is going to be somewhat different, at least in eternity, so that you know, when I'm resurrected or when I die and I'm in Christ's presence, the waiting for the rapture will not feel quite as long, or at least time will be bent in some sense. A day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. So maybe what, maybe a thousand years on earth will only feel like a day or two in heaven. Again, I don't quite know, but I do know this. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. So whoever dies is immediately in God's presence. They have some kind of intermediate body or something that God does that is waiting for the day when they will return with Christ at the, uh, or at the rapture. I'm sorry. When Christ raptures us, then their uh, bodies that are in the dust are reunited with their spirits and they have a glorified body. We who are alive and remain immediately receive that glorified body. But I think that happens at the rapture uh, right before the tribulation. And we will have that glorified body as we go into uh, the millennial kingdom here on earth. Another question. Uh, in Revelation 21, 14, uh, whose name is included in the 12 apostles on the foundation of the wall? Do you think it's Matthias? Um, I don't think it's Judas. Uh, so Matthias would make the most sense. There are some that argue that the 12th apostle really should have been Paul, that when the disciples made this choice between, um, oh, what was his name, uh, Barsabbas or uh, Barabbas, I don't think it was Barabbas, but it was something like that, or Matthias that uh, they cast lots and went to Matthias. Some people think that maybe the apostles sort of jumped the gun and should have waited because Paul, that God intended Paul to be the 12th apostle. There's parts of that argument that I sort of resonate with because it does seem like Paul was the one who God used and maybe is supposed to be that 12th apostle. But I think it's probably Matthias. Um, one of the distinctions that Matthias had to Paul, if you remember, Peter said that, that the qualifications for choosing that replacement for Judas was someone that had been with Jesus from the baptism of John all the way to his ascension. Though Paul did see the resur resurrected Christ, and in that sense he was apostle, he was not with Jesus, as far as we know, and not that I would know of, from the time of John's baptism to his ascension. And Matthias was. We don't know much about him. Uh, the scriptures don't talk about him again, but he seems to be the one that God appointed, and so that would be my guess. Of course, another question would be, who are the 12 names of the sons of uh, Jacob that are on the gates? Because if you look in Revelation um, 7, that's a different list than what we see. And, and Dan's not on there, but Levi is. And uh, so, again, we don't quite know. Uh, I guess God will figure it out, and I guess we'll know when we get there. But um, So I don't quite know, but if I had to cast my lot for one of the choices, I'd probably say Matthias at this point. Then another question, does the warning in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, which talks about not adding or taking away from God's word, uh, is that speaking specifically of the book of Revelation or is it going beyond that to all of scripture? Um, that's another good question. I think it's specifically referring to the book of Revelation that we're not to add or take away from this prophecy. But since Revelation is the last book of the canon, uh, it is the final chapter. I mean, um, what better way could God end his book but by the book of Revelation, which takes what's lost in Genesis and shows it restored in Revelation? I think it is the uh, final chapter that God intended. So I do think his warning could go for all of Scripture. Uh, as someone has said, uh, uh, liberals will want to take away from God's word and say some of this is not inspired or some of it's not good. Uh, cults and others will try to add to it. And so you see errors on both sides. 
And I think those that stick to the completed canon, the 66 books, 39 of the Old Testament, 27 of the New, I think that's where um, the faith is once and all, once for all delivered to the saints. And I would say, yeah, there is a warning to, obviously it's to Revelation per, perhaps specifically, but I see it as having broader application to all of scripture. Then they went on and asked, well, is that a good argument for those in the Mormon faith? Um, could be, I assume the Mormons probably have a good answer for that. I'm sure it's been brought up with them before. I think the bigger issue with the Mormon faith is the fact that they don't believe in salvation uh, by grace through faith. They're still trying to work for their salvation. Um, and so they have no eternal security. They have no assurance. And if you look at their material, and I've been in one of their temples, uh, you don't see the cross and the resurrection. Those things are just not emphasized. And that is the core of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. If there is no cross and resurrection, then the rest uh, doesn't give us much hope because none of us can meet the requirements of the law. That's what the whole New Testament's about is that we all fall short and there's there's no way any of us could be justified by works of the law. And that's what uh, the Mormon faith is trying to do is be justified by the works of the law. So perhaps the better approach, you could try that Revelation one, but my assumption is they'll probably have a good comeback to that because I'm sure they've probably uh, been asked that before. But keep, keep going back to the core of the gospel. Christ died for us, he rose again. Christ died for us, he rose again that there's something wrong with my heart and, and my works are never going to be enough to meet the righteousness of God. And I need a savior. And God's love is such that he did what I could not do. And God demonstrates his love for us. And that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So I just keep going back to the core of the gospel because in the end, that's where the power is. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So somehow in the midst of all the debates, just keep going back to the cross and the resurrection, because in the end, that's the gospel and that's what's going to save. And so that's where I would probably emphasize um, in any aspect of talking to someone that has a different uh, viewpoint. And then another question I received during the series is, are we seeing the last days unfold around us? Um, are people like Bill Gates, George Soros, other globalists, are they part of the coming government of the Antichrist? Whew, that's a big one. Um, like I said before, uh, the Bible says we are living in the last days because after Christ's return, I mean, after his ascension, he could come back at any time. I believe in the imminence of the rapture. In other words, that it could happen at any moment. The early church thought the same thing, that there are no signs that have to precede Christ's coming. And that's important to realize um, because Christ could come at any moment. Now, I think uh, Israel becoming a nation again, well, that was uh, certainly raised some antenna. But in theory, God could have raptured us and then Israel could have become a nation through some other means. So there are no signs that have to precede that. And so um, we don't know when Christ could come back. It could be today. It could be 100 years from now. We always have to live with that kind of tension. And that's why we have to be careful. Uh, we are living in the last days. Christ could come back. I think anytime you see what's going on in the world, you think, well, wow, it could happen anytime. But like I said, if I lived during the days of World War II, I think it's going to happen then. Um, Y2K, you remember that? That was something people thought was going to be the precursor. The Gulf War, I remember all those books about Saddam Hussein and rebuilding of Babylon. We thought that was the time. So I'm always leery of any time that someone says now's the time or based on some things we see because we're seeing these things at different times and you just don't know. And oftentimes that leads to speculation. And so we just, I try to avoid that. But you, you certainly see the pieces being moved into place. And at least you can see, yes, there are globalists. There are people... I think many of them probably have good intentions. If there's ever going to be peace on the world, they're thinking, well, we need to all be together. We um, we need to have a one world government. Uh, like I said, a um, guy by the name of Robert Mueller, not the special prosecutor guy, but the other guy who died, I think, in 2010. He was an assistant general secretary, uh, assistant to the general secretary, whatever the leader is of the U.N., I was called the philosopher of the UN. He's, he wrote many papers on the need for a one world government and even a one world religion. 
And he was writing it with this good intention of this is what's going to bring the world together. Um, I think he was deceived. And I think that one world government is going to be the way that God or the Antichrist uses. Um, and I think we see the pieces being moved into place. We see pieces of uh, cashless society being moved into place. We see these things happening. We just don't know when that time is. And our focus is to be on our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, not trying to figure out some of those things. We're to be aware of them, but our focus has to be on Christ above everything else. And 2 Thessalonians 2 says that the man of sin or the man of lostness will be revealed at a certain time, uh, probably when he signs that treaty with Israel or at some point, and he's going to be revealed, which implies that right now um, we're making guesses in the dark and God will reveal him at the proper time. And so we just need to trust him in the midst of some of the things going on and not get so sidetracked that we find ourselves given into speculation or just being overwhelmed and taking our eyes off of Christ. Uh, also remember first Thessalonians, it says that there's actually going to be people saying peace and safety, peace and safety when Christ comes, and it's going to be unexpected. And so in some sense, right now, with everybody amped up, uh, it, it's almost maybe not the time. It may be when things calm down. It's interesting when things are amped up, we're sort of uh, expecting them to come at any point. But the implication seems to be when things are have reached a more of a calm and people are sort of relaxed, that Christ will come. And so... Maybe sometimes we have it backwards and we're too, um, too uh, amped up and expecting it when things are going crazy, when we should always have that eager ex expectancy, no matter whether things are good or whether they're bad. And I will say one more word about conspiracies. It seems like a good time to say it because I see, hey, we live in a world where you don't even know who to trust. There's stuff all online. People can no telling who you can. Anybody with a computer and a Facebook Live, just like me tonight, can say anything they want and people can get pulled off into all kinds of things. And because we don't know who to trust anymore, we don't know what news source to trust, we're just pulled to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We're just, uh, you know, just emotionally, mentally pulled back and forth. I always go back to Isaiah 8 because in Isaiah, they were dealing with a, another strange time. And um, it basically says, do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, let him be your fear, let him be your dread, and he will be as a sanctuary to you. But I just think it's a good reminder. Um, Back then, people were always looking for conspiracies and agendas and hidden things. And believe me, I know those things are going on. I'm just saying we can't figure all that out. And there's things that are beyond us. And it gets us off track and off focus. And what God told Isaiah is exactly, I think, what he would tell us today. Don't get caught up in all of that stuff. Make your fear and your dread be God. He's sovereign. He's the one that's pulling the strings. Let him be your sanctuary. Find your refuge in him. And when you keep your focus on him, it helps you keep everything else in the right perspective. I think as I, let's see, I don't know if there's any questions over here. Let me see if I can uh, scroll down and see if there's any other questions maybe I missed. Um, yeah. uh, I think I got most of them. Let's see. Uh, if you do have another question, feel free to submit it later on and maybe I can email you something. Like I said, I I have questions myself, but in the end, just remember that Revelation is all about giving us hope and pointing us to Christ. I do want to end with probably my favorite passage. I've, I've used it so much that many of you may be getting tired of me using it, but because I think the big question is, you know, and I do think it sure looks like Christ could come back at any time. At least all the pieces have lined up. And he could come back at any time. And I do think the next uh, event on the prophetic calendar is the rapture and that trumpet's going to blow. And like like that, uh, we're suddenly in, in the presence of God. And that's a blessed hope. So how do you live? How do you live in the last days? Or how do you live with this understanding that Christ could come back any time? I always go back to 1 Peter 4. Because what 1 Peter 4 tells us 
is how we're to live all the time. And remember what he says, uh, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. So the end of all things is at hand. It's, it's coming. So here's the therefore. Clear-minded, learn how to think. Uh, self-controlled, don't get pulled in 5,000 different directions. Stay self-controlled, sober-minded, be at rest, take a breath, follow after Christ. Why? So that you can pray. Uh, we are to be a people of prayer during this time. Um, I've been wearing this, uh, Pray Louisiana. We got a bunch of these at the church. I encourage you to pick it up. I've been taking that 31 days of prayer for our nation. And I sort of have it right there in my, in my prayer closet. And I pray over whatever that prayer is for that day. Um, that's what Daniel did in Babylon. I think that's what we're called to do and just to be faithful in prayer, thinking, watching what's going on in the world, not getting upset by it, but then just taking it to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm confused by this stuff. I need discernment. Help me know how to live today for your glory. Then it says in verse eight, and above all things, have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sins. When things start getting chaotic and crazy, um, you know, what does scripture say? When lawlessness abounds, the love of many will grow cold. So the more crazy it gets in the world, the harder it is to love other people. Uh, let's be honest. I'll just go ahead and say it. You know, in the midst of all these mandates and, and uh, stay at home orders and quarantine and mask mandates, all these things create tension and cause believers on both sides to start sort of lo uh, lobbing things back and forth on social media. And unfortunately, uh, because it plays out on social media, oftentimes that can hinder our witness because, um, hey, this is a good chance for us to learn what it means to understand we're going to understand things differently. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. Some people are going to remind us of our liberties, and that can be a good thing. And some people are going to remind us of our responsibilities to uh, care for one another and watch after the health of someone else. And that's a, a good thing. And so to know how to balance these things is difficult, but love one another. Um, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. If it's possible, as, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. Uh, to bear with one another, to love one another. Love covers a multitude of sins, not to get caught up in, in some of these things. But this is the time of all times, believer, to keep the... Make, the main thing, the main thing, and say, I'm going to walk in humility. I may not understand another person's viewpoint, but I'm going to do everything I can to make love be the focus of my life because that becomes our greatest witness. How will people know we're his disciples? By our love for one another. And as things get crazy and chaotic and divisive, our love for one another is going to be the thing that sets us apart and makes us uh, a witness for him. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Isn't it interesting? In the midst of the end times, he says, don't isolate yourself, but be hospitable. Open up your life. Open up your heart. Um, I think it's just talking about a generosity that's I'm not going to hoard things and uh, try to grab on to more stuff and pull away from things. I'm going to find ways to be a blessing to others and be generous. And then as each one has received the gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God's given you a gift. He's given me a gift. Uh, what does he want us to do? Be faithful with the gift that he's given us, um, with the opportunities he's given us. And so as I uh, end this series, I'm going to just end again with this message. How do we live in the midst of all of this? Uh, first thing is think. In other words, uh, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Uh, renew your mind every day through the Word of God. Please do not begin your day by turning on the news and reading all this stuff that's going on in the world. That will throw you off from day one or from the first moment of the day. Give God the first fruits of your day. Find scripture, read it. Let that renew your focus. Pray, get on your knees and pray. Go for a walk and pray. And then when your mind is prepared and equipped with the word of God, then you might watch some of the news, but then you filter it through a totally different filter. And so think. And then the second thing is pray. Uh, you want to be clear mind and self-controlled so that you can pray. If we're not on our knees, we are not going to have discernment. Um, 
you do not have the mental capacity to understand what's going in this world unless the spirit of God has given you wisdom. Uh, don't become a Gnostic and think you have some kind of secret knowledge that enables you to interpret things that nobody else in the world can interpret. Uh, you need every day the spirit of God to guide you and to give you wisdom. And things are changing so quickly in this world that every day, there's not a day that goes by. I don't need to say, God, fill me with your spirit and give me your wisdom. So I know how to make it through this day in a way that honors you. The third thing is love. Uh, love covers a multitude of sins. You might get irritated with another believer. Find a way to say, get past that. Bear with them. Love them. Let your sweet reasonableness be known to all. And may God's love so saturate you that it just flows out naturally and becomes a fruit of the spirit as he changes you. Uh, share. I think that idea of hospitality is just to learn to share, um, to be open with the gifts God's given me and to use those to bless others. And then finally, serve. Take the gifts that I have been given and serve others. And so that's God's end time checklist. And so, again, as you think through what's going on in the world um, and every day seems to throw a new curveball at us, this would be, I think, what Revelation, what Peter, what the Paul, what the New Testament would be telling us. Renew your mind. Think through the word of God. Pray. Be dependent upon the spirit of God. Love. Keep manifesting the love of Christ in what you do. Share. Take the resources God has given you and be generous with them. And whatever gift you have, serve. And what's cool is whether Christ comes back today or he comes back 100 years from now, if you live like this, you have been faithful. And God calls us to be faithful. And this is what it means to be faithful. And this would be what I think you'd want us to do when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, enter into the joy of your Lord. So Believer, hopefully this has been a good series for you. If you've missed some of it, go back. They should be posted on YouTube, um, Facebook Live. Um, it is a joy for me to be your pastor. I love this body of believers. Um, we, my wife and I, pray for this body of believers every day. Our desire is as Christ walks among the lampstands and he sees our lampstand, that he would fan the flame and allow us to make an impact in this generation for his glory. And so will you pray that along with me uh, every day at 516 or whenever that God would just uh, use us for his glory and that we'd be his ambassadors um, in this present time so that we could be a witness for him. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hopefully you've been encouraged. I know I went a little long, but hey, if you've been around CBC long enough, you know that's not unusual. Um, I will be, Liz and I will be going on vacation, Lord willing, this week and spending some time up north visiting uh, some friends and Josh and Tiffany. We're looking forward to seeing them and my son who's up in Michigan. And we don't know what we're going to face up there because every state seems to have its own situation. So pray for us as we travel and we'll be praying for you. And uh, in the end, uh, even so, come Lord Jesus. Uh, we'll see you soon, CBC.